Looks like we made it to episode two of Community of Independence on DCTV season two. It's quite a milestone for us because we had no show the other week because half the crew was away at the Primavera Festival in Catalonia, myself excluded. Not that I'm bitter about it or anything. You know, I, I finally got my Dennis the Menace fan club badge in the mail. So been waiting 16 years for that. You know, I would have missed that if I was in Spain drinking cervezas and watching great bands. Been representing. Anyway, we have a great show lined up for you tonight. We're going to have music and chat in the studio from Keen Nugent. We're going to be talking to Declan and Colum from the Electronic Music Collective Kabugi. We have the second of our Joyful Slog profiles on Crayon Smith, and we even have a look back at Record Store Day 2012. So that's all to come on tonight's show, Community of Independence on DCTV. And to kick us off, here's a bit of rose-tinted nostalgia for you. We're going to look back at what really matters. This is a dark horse, take me home.
I kabuki, oogie oogie, I kabuki all night long. Yeah, I'm joined by Colm and Declan from Kabuki. Sorry for that awful, awful intro. I couldn't resist. Uh, how are you, gentlemen? Good. Very well, thank you. Yeah, for even in spite Cheers. of my singing. Um, <laughs> tell us, what is Kabuki? Uh, well, it's a small collective of people who started just six and a half years ago. Um, started off just wanting to put on gigs, um, then after a while wanting to support local acts, up and, up and coming acts. Um, so started doing that, and then that spiralled into being able to get inter uh, international acts interested in maybe having some releases as well. Um, and then we do like radio shows and as many gigs as we can. So um, yeah. That's when it. it started in 2006, what was the goal? Was there a void there in dance music that you're trying to fill? Um, there was a void, yeah. There was. Um Richie, one, Richie Kabugi, one of the one of the guys at Kabugi, had booked Aaron Spector. That was the first night. I came along to DJ. That's where I met a lot of the other guys. Um, and there was kind of breakup at the time was kicking off, and we had a lot of great records in that area. And there was nothing really like that happening in Ireland or Dublin. So Aaron Spector was brought over to play an amazing mosh-up set, and that was kind of the kickoff. And then on the strength of the reaction, like it was like a heaving mosh basically on the strength of that reaction um, so I keep doing this yeah. um, in terms of bringing over international acts logistically was that quite difficult to organize sometimes well like with the first one that was it the eye opener was because you know we had just before the first one happened and before it was it was Richie was kind of the original idea and uh, it was you know we were sitting around complaining about how these acts go and play you know from say mainland Europe and they go they might play a few gigs in England and maybe like one in Belfast or somewhere else in Ireland and not in Dublin. And yeah. then just instead of moping about it, we're like, well, realistically, the you know the the fees and you know uh, venue rentals, like maybe this is so you know feasible. So we looked into it and uh, yeah, we just realised well, if we break even, that's fine. You know, we get to have a good party for our friends. And um, then it went so well, we just said, let's make this regular if we can. So yeah, yeah kind of went from there. Yeah, and it was really. Kind of mind blowing because before I met the Kabuki guys, I'd played that kind of edgy or whatever you want to say end of electronic music and beats, and it was quite find hard to find an audience for it in, in Dublin, you know. Mm. And all of a sudden, there was a huge audience, and it was great fun. Great. I realised there was such a strong audience out there. Yeah. Well, you guys have also made a point of trying to support and champion local acts, homegrown DJs and producers. What do you think of the scene now in comparison to when you started? Is it in a healthy state? Yeah, it's the healthiest it's ever been. Mm. Um, Why so? Loads of reasons. I think, you know, all electronic music has been democratised. You can copy the software or the software is cheap or whatever. You don't need a studio. You don't need to live in London or wherever. Yeah. I think that uh, every independent music is finding that. So Irish independent electronic music is, 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 is that as well. You know, the culture has developed. So there's a huge... Declan, we do a radio show together on Radio Nolifa. And Declan's section of the show was often 100% Irish, and um, usually almost 100% Irish. And you couldn't have done that even two or three years ago, mm. and kept up a, a kind of decent quality. And now he does it. I'd still, I wouldn't say it's still easy. He works hard, but um, you know, that's a, that's a huge change. Definitely grown. Yeah. yeah. Obviously, over the six years, uh, what you guys are doing, it's grown, and the labels emerged from that. What do you think you've learned from doing it? I mean, what would be the do's and don'ts you'd say to people? Well, first, just do it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. Do, do it. Just go it? for it. It's possible. Yeah, I wouldn't really say any don'ts, you know. Be, car be careful you don't be doing silly things and booking, you know, you need to be confident as a crowd. It's kind of a hard mix of taking risks and um, and being confident. So you just have to try and judge it well and, mm -hmm. and do it. What do you reckon? Yeah, it's easy to spend, like, say, three gigs in a row making a few hundred quid and then get all confident and make yeah. some big elaborate booking and then blow a grand and you're back to square one and you know in our case that might have affected like setback like label like things being released and stuff like that so just yeah yeah a bit rational a big <laughs> lesson if there was a big kind of you know rather than just do it it's um you know try and get a nice venue try and get a cheap nice venue good sound system look after all those things you know try not to be forking out large amounts of money to, to be hosted in expensive nightclubs. Mm. Mm. Do you think the venues are there in this climate? Yes and no. You have to put the work in. You know, they're closing down. at the moment. Mm. Up and down. You'll, you know, you'll, a good venue will come along for a number of months that works well. You always need to be on the lookout for venues. At the moment, we're doing a lot of gigs in King 7 and in Cable yeah. Street, and that's been going really well. Good equipment, good people, nice place to go, clean even. Um, 
so that's a that's the big that's one of the main things that's fine and also find you know there was occasionally we'd be doing a lot of gigs in the, say the same venue one of, the, one of the big clubs which is a great venue and not saying that bad about a venue but people get a bit bored going to the same place sure. all the time it's nice to find new interesting places a new vibe and all that <laughs> yeah well you're planning a lot for the rest of the year there's a gig on saturday tell us about that yeah it's it's um dj mech deviant neil buchanan all kind of um, imploded viewed some of the cream of irish hip-hop we're using scratch o vision for us where um tell us about scratch o vision quickly. scratch o vision is basically there's a thing you can do these days there's a vinyl controller if this is not getting boring and, and technical which it is i suppose but you can con you can control basically the music with a vinyl controller on a set of turntables but you can these days you can also control the video okay, so yeah. i want to see people see the actual scratch if you want yeah, 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 fresh yeah. from a toothpaste ad <laughs> scratch. So I'm collecting, I'm going to set that up and then talented uh, scratchers like Mech and Neil Buchanan and Jaculate and Moss Chops, etc. And, De and Deviant will hopefully implement this and we'll be able to see the scratches okay, as they happen. Okay, so you're so in on the ground floor have, of Scratch Vision. I have painted, I have painted <laughs> Brilliant. What, what about releases then? Is there anything physical coming out from Kabugi? Uh, well, we have a few digital releases coming up soon and then we're getting on board for the next few uh, the next few vinyls, there's a, a split in the making. We can't really say for sure yet now at the moment, okay. but uh, yeah, that's um, something we'd be really excited about. It's um, again a mixture of like local acts and international acts um, with each release. Um, so yeah, that's the, the next physical one. But then after that, they're going to be quite regular because um, the, the input we're getting now, like the submissions kind of, and the, you know the people who will say yes when we ask them for for tunes compared to. When we first started, you know, we send emails and get no replies or whatever, or someone else already having it, like you know, a different label has already got their hands on it before us. And so now we're in, yeah, in a good position to be able to have, yeah, mm -hmm. say if it was like a compilation, you know, two tracks on each side of the vinyl, we could have two Irish tracks or three Irish tracks, and then get an international act as well. So, um, you know, it's it's great to hear when when we get feedback from like vinyl sales that you know six people in Japan, you know, because they wanted to get this one particular one of an international on it. They've now got these three other songs from small Dublin acts, like dudes who have day jobs and stuff. Um, it's being bought by people all over the world, so that's pretty good. Yeah, that's cool. Um, well, look, thanks very much for coming into us, Colm and Declan from Kabugi. Thank you very much. Cheers. On man. the notes of uh, records, actually, a little tie in here. We have a look back at Record Store Day 2012. Happened a long time ago. Back in April, we did a lot of filming, threw out a lot of footage, and what's left is this neat little package. Over to you. Here we are in Wicklow Street, outside Tower Records. I'm here at the Outhouse Records store. Uh, we're here now at uh, Elastic Witch Records. Yeah, a lot of people down yeah. for records early. I'm all about vinyl, I only buy vinyl to be honest with you. Um, and Record Store Day is a great thing. I think it's a good way to get the communities from everywhere to get out and get excited about music and vinyl again. So tell, tell me what you guys think about uh, Record Store Day in general and how your day has been so far. Um, I think it's a really good idea. I think it's great to have so many people coming down and like sort of. Uh, spending money on music, like they might be downloading otherwise, and it really encourages like sort of the, the community to sort of like music and stuff in Dublin. So that's cool. It's kind of incredible, like the generosity of like Dublin-based bands. Um, also, I think one of the most attractive things was that everyone wants to play on Record Store Day. You know, it's great. It's great to uh, have a gig on Record Store Day. album then you bought that uh, you really kind of would have influenced it musically and wow. on vinyl or just on vinyl or just in general any record I can't even remember the first first, record I bought. first album that I bought that kind of made me go ah oh, was an Irish band called Curb Dog their album on the turn yeah, yeah. Uh, it's just an amazing it's still to say it's an amazing album
what about the first records you guys ever bought? Do you wish to share them with us? It's embarrassing. Uh, my first record. Um, I bought a. I was about five, I think, and uh, my dad had bought it. Like it was a. Uh, uh, it's really embarrassing. Do you remember the Wombles? Yeah, I remember you're a Womble and Womble. I have that. Was, uh, the R and Oco kid. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember that one. That was a much later was hit a, for the Wombles. Single. Uh, it was on vinyl. It was in a second hand shop and. Uh, I wanted that like. Uh, I think the first thing I ever bought was uh, Do the Bartman. Oh, wow. I think. Uh, oh, that Nudgy Nudgy one? Yeah, or maybe even Zig and Zag Christmas rap, something like that. What yourself on? Um, I'm not embarrassed about it. It was uh, Michael Jackson's Bad on cassette. Much better. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, that was good. Feeling the vibe in Elastic Witch today, it's pretty good, man. Feeling the vibe. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. That's, yeah, it's pretty amazing. Like, I mean, um, yeah, the last couple have been really good. Uh, I remember, like, it being really sunny last year and being outside with loads of people and, you know, basically hanging around, talking about music, you know, comparing what you bought and all that kind of stuff. And that's really what record shopping and music is all about, really, you know, having something physical to have. And I think Record Store Day is the best way to do that, I guess. Today is important, gathering people here at Outhouse, at Tower Records, at Elastic Witch, and getting people out to record stores. You think it's, why do you think it's important? Um, I, I suppose just to, uh, like first of all, like as a medium for bands to get out their music, like uh, by, by like deliberate, like, like that you could actually go out and make an effort to go see a band is different than to staying at home and downloading uh, or different to hearing it on an advert or in a film or or, or whatever like to go go out and like have the motivation and like, keep music special and the last of which is just only uh, over six months old now at this stage and this is your very first record store day so has yeah. it been a really positive experience it's been yeah today yeah it was amazing it was my favorite day since i opened the place apart from the day that i opened the place <laughs> so yeah yeah it's great Brilliant. Record Store Day 2012, a great gig altogether. And hey, speaking of gigs, it's time for that all important part of the show where I make disparaging comments about questionable events backed by the greatest oddities Google Images can find. It's the gig guides, obviously. We're starting with a gig tomorrow night in the Workman's Club. Very good gig, actually. It's 8 p.m. at start. It's a free gig, quarter inch collective release party, and that's featuring Janola, the bridges of Madison County. Simon Bird, different one to that one, and also DJ Gavin Elstead. I'm just going to step out of the way and let you admire this image for a moment of DJ Gavin Elstead. Remarkable stuff. Tomorrow night in Whelan's there's a gig with some impeccable Bonnie Vera imitators. It's not James Vincent McMorrow and Band. No, it's the Low Anthem. The Low Anthem. For 20 euro you can see them. Or alternatively, you could buy nine tubs of low, low cheddar cheese chunks with ham and still have change left over. Choice is yours. I know what I'd go for. Tomorrow night in the Academy 2, Dublin's Indie Rock, Phantom 105.2, are doing another gig. Fair play to them. They've managed to get over the leaders of men. Look at the leaders of men, how do they manage that? I hear they're kind of like a earth, wind and fire meets Tenari wind kind of vibe. So it should be a good gig in the Academy 2 tomorrow night. Uh, Saturday in the Unitarian Church, it's the shoplift pop of Ham Sandwich. Uh, Saturday in Whelan's, upstairs, I'm Your Vinyl are doing a gig. Saturday in the Joinery in Smithfield, you can see James Ferraro, Bodyguard and School Tour, our old friend School Tour. And also, final gig, it's not really a gig, Sunday in the Bernard Shaw, it's the Motown Party. That is now the required hipster dress code for the Bernard Shaw, just so you're aware, okay? So that's all our gigs. Other than that, go watch the football, I suppose. If you have a gig you'd like us to promote, however, get a decent band name. 
get a mildly amusing image to go with that band name and send us an email coi at dctv.ie. Now somebody who did play a gig for us was Crayon Smith. He played the Joyful Slog gig back in May and there is a kid with a crayon up his nose just to illustrate that point. Now I must point out as well, I forgot to mention it in the first episode of Community Independence, but the Joyful Slog documentary, which of course was launched back in May, is still available online. We're very grateful for all the feedback to that documentary made by John, Sean and Barry. Now, Crayon Smith played the gig for us. Aoife Barry met them this week. You're going to see some footage from the gig. You're going to see some footage of Aoife Barry talking to them. Why don't we just watch it? This is Crayon Smith on Community of Independence. Enjoy. So we're here in uh, Sony Batter on, I wouldn't quite say a sunny day, but maybe a little bit of a, of a dull day, but yeah. you know, it's a bit of warmth here. It's May. I'm talking to Crayon Smith. There's a dog barking in the background. <laughs> um, and for people who maybe might not be familiar with the history of Crayon Smith, Crayon, do you want to talk me a little bit through that, about where you started off yourself, making your lo-fi music on a four track, I do believe, yeah, to now? Yeah. And uh, I, uh, making songs on four track and then uh, about 2004 started gigging, got two friends involved and uh, played, played like gigs till about uh, 2009, yep. uh, put out two albums, then took a break, just went back to writing, took a break from gigging. Yeah. And uh, I told the two lads who I was playing, I was like, I need, I just need a break. So uh, thanks a million. Yeah. Go on, do, <laughs> go, go, on, go on with your other projects. Yeah. Uh, and then I know Wayne for years. Yeah. Um, uh, we played gigs with Wayne's old band Waiting Room. And uh, I said to Wayne, I've got these songs, do you want to come in, come in on them? And then uh, Richie as well. But the, the thing about this was it was uh, it wasn't my thing. It was like a, a three way kind of like yeah. a band band as opposed to mm -hmm. one dude and like getting his mates in. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it would have been initially you kind of doing mostly everything really until it maybe came to the live or maybe came to the kind of the last. It kind of just like I'd arrive with the, the, the start the zero zero and the three forty yeah. four or whatever, and then the yeah. lads would do their their bass in there. Yeah. Are you laughing at that? Are you? <laughs> <laughs> and the lads and the lads doing their parts then, like yeah. like role playing bass and role playing yeah. uh, keys and stuff. And Wayne, how did you feel there when Kieran came up to you and said, "Listen, can you uh, be in Christmas from now on?" How did you feel about that? Was um, it, did you jump at the chance? Or? I, I, yeah, pretty much. Like, yeah, um, I always I was always a fan of, of his music as much as it pains me to pay him a compliment. <laughs> like, um, so yeah, there's, 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 a, there's a counterbalance coming up now. <laughs> right. right. Um, so I moved up to Dublin about a year and a half ago. And uh, yeah, just at the same time, Kieran was kind of getting stuff together for like a new album and kind of asked me to get involved. It's, yeah, I was really, really happy to do it. Yeah, so, I yeah. mean, were you at the stage where you really wanted to do something new musically? Or, I mean, did it come at the right time for you or did it kind of come out of the blue? Um, it came at a good time. <laughs> we've, been, we've been like meeting up for years, like, like any time I'd go to Cork or visit, we'd always meet up for a coffee and just, what do you listen to? Mm -hmm. What do you like, you know, and we, we found that we were kind of meeting. Yeah. On the same page and a lot of different things. Yeah, and I guess yeah, at like the time, like yeah, we were kind of, kind of um, just kind of talked a good bit about it before we actually played anything as well, just kind of saying what we wanted to do, kind of like just for writing kind of songs and kind of sounds and that kind of stuff and different not influences that we'd rip off per se, but that like, kind of <laughs> starting point. You heard it here first. Yeah, you know, yeah. Well, you know, like, coming from the same kind of yeah. starting point, then going off and just trying to write good songs, then really like you know. Yeah. I think it's a big, it's a big part of the process. It's like uh, the same with Richie. Like it's just hanging out listen to music and find you know and like if you can like agree on six of eight things and then mm -hmm. that other person brings the the two things that you don't match yeah. and, and it's uh and that's that that, that is your starting point did that really so change the dynamic and the energy of cranesmith for yourself then uh yeah di different way of working uh it's it's starting in a band room as opposed to starting in a bedroom and arriving mm. with the song yeah. and it's uh it's you, you get like if you get a minute's worth out of a new song and yeah. then you go right that's an, like let's not kill ourselves mm -hmm. record it take the mp3 home and then move on to something else you're working on the follow-up to white wonder so yeah. it's like a new team really obviously you're at the core of the first trans as well stay loose and white wonder but mm -hmm. um can you tell me about where you are in the album process at the moment what stage are you at with the new album uh so we are coming close to finishing it now it's uh uh we've been working in the last year on about 18 different songs and it's kind of like right knowing what's not working and, or, and right we'll decide on these 12 or 10 and just finishing off like there's one or two to kind of uh fine tune i guess mm -hmm. and then uh then we look at recording like we we'd like to just kind of do a recording across three days i suppose yeah. as opposed to half and half isn't that kind of it? Yeah, yeah 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 all in one block like so it's just getting everything ready for that so we it's like practice on a weekly writing on a weekly basis take the mp an mp3 home with a session and we're all like what about this? What about this? 
email suggestions and stuff and then take those suggestions back to the Yeah, I think it's just kind of taking by taking time over each song to making sure that like each song is as good as it can be, you know. Mm -hmm. Just like keep suggesting things until you've no more nothing more to suggest and <laughs> yeah. it's all no that yeah. that it's all in there like yeah. Yeah, and yeah, that, yeah. The, like the side that side of the song is an example of uh that took a while like I mean, it started off as something completely different, you know. And we almost kind of got thrown away um, almost at the start because it was a totally different there was one riff in the song that was, was pretty cool but the rest of it wasn't really working so then we kind of changed it around and over like months it became like the, the a finished song which is completely different you, you, you'd, you'd, you'd leave it go on to something else and figure that one out and then you go oh through doing that we know not, not, we know what to do with the other one now yeah. and bring that through and that is like the, the new process of just writing less and just bringing suggestions and then the two lads react to that then or yeah. something you know and so we'll really get to hear we obviously got to hear some of it at the community of independence tonight and we've got a clip of sideways coming up in a little bit as well but how do you feel about the fundraiser as well for the album that's, that's going to happen on the 20th of july are you quite excited about that night i mean what does that really mean for you is that kind of like the apex of, of, of where you are at the moment that you're heading towards that particular date i'm dying for it i'm dying yeah. for it yeah it's uh it's our first it's our first dublin headline isn't it uh, yeah, 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 we, we, yeah. we kind of shared a headline with Elk, but I mean, shared a gig, but yeah. It's yeah, yeah, yeah for, with the, the seven inch launch. Yeah. Uh, yeah, down for it, it's just, um, and playing the Community of Independence was, uh, uh, I think we played to a lot of people we hadn't played before. Yeah. Mm. And uh, it was just, uh, it felt good, play, like, um, and the, the, it's just, it's, it's like, Wayne's an amazing drummer, and it's to, to have that energy behind you, and with Richie as well, like, it's, uh, it's far more... I, for me, it's far more visceral. Yeah. You know? Well, it was great chatting to you. I can't wait you to hear too. the album, and I hope everybody uh, really gives um, a lot of money to the fundraiser <laughs> as well because uh, it's always good to help out bands and to really feel that you're part of the, the process as well for bands. Oh, so cool. I'm looking forward as well to seeing this live performance of Sideways from the Community of Independence, Mike. And uh, best of luck with the new album and everything, guys. Thanks very much. Thanks a lot. Thank Thanks. You. It was true.
Thanks. Thank you. Crayon Smith there with Sideways playing the Joyful Slog gig in the Button Factory. I'm joined by Keen Nugent. Thank you very much for coming to us, Keen. Not too bad, not too bad. Now let me ask you, you're signed to VHF Records, an American label. How do they get involved with you? Well, yeah, VHF, we have had a little bit of, we've been in contact for a few years and it was kind of because I, I did some touring with a guy, um, Jack Rose, who has actually since died. And um, he, he released his records on VHF and um, he, was, he was a real kind of like a great encouragement for me. And um, yeah, we did, did a bit of touring together and I guess he kind of said to, to the guy Bill who runs VHF, it's kind of, it's a pretty small operation. It's just mm -hmm. this, this one guy, Bill, who's a very kind man and a very kind of like enthusiastic. And um, he works for the Library of Congress in Washington. And um, so he's just kind of been like, I, I, made, I made this album, the album that I released last year, Doubles. Mm -hmm. And uh, I kind of made it and then was just shopping it out to, to record labels, trying to find somebody to, to waste 9,000 euro on. And, uh, or whatever, I don't even know what it cost. But, um, so sent it, sent it around to a few people and eventually kind of got, got Bill was, was, was kind of game for it. Yeah. And uh, it's, all, it's always just been a pretty informal kind of, um, he's just, we kind of seem, seems to work out pretty well. Yeah. Um, and yeah, he, he's thankfully got a job, so he's able to afford it. Sure. Um, um, the Ameri American exposure for you, though, has been pretty good. I mean, you've, you've gotten your name yeah. out to quite a few sources in America, like NPR have picked up on yeah. stuff, and Pitchfork as well. Yeah. I think the NPR guy is a, is a cool guy called Lars, yeah. and uh, actually I played in, in Washington, D.C. about like four years ago or something, um, and to about, about six or seven people. And he was one of the guys that showed up, and he's just, he was just uh, he's just always been kind of enthusiastic and, yeah. and cool. Yeah. Um, something you've been very enthusiastic about is Black Flag. When did you first hear their music? How did it affect you? Yeah, um, Black Flag. I've kind of they're one of those ones that when I was a teenager, I was always sort of wary of. Because um, you'd see a certain type of person in a Black Flag T-shirt, I imagine. I don't know what it was. I always I kind of was like Black Flag punk and classic rock. I was always like, I don't want to go there. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think it was just kind of like uh, teenage pretentiousness thinking that, that there was something wrong with them. And uh, then when I reached about the age of 19 or so, I realized that like Black Flag and Led Zeppelin were both amazing and I'd, I'd been wasting my time not listening to them. Um, and yeah, just kind of, it kind of got me, like I suppose later than a lot of people. Hmm. Um, but, um, they kind of, when I heard them, it was like, what I was thought, it sounds a bit ridiculous, but I was like, wow, this is kind of kind of weird weird guitar playing. Um, and I just really liked the kind of, sort of mixture of kind of like dissonance, but, and, and mental illness, and, uh, and kind of like straightforward, like, I, th I think yeah. it's got a real good balance between the kind of like, the normal and the not normal. Yeah, definitely, Greg Ginn kind of, fosters some dementia there in his yeah. guitar playing. Yeah. Um, so obviously it influenced your style and you've done a cover of them recently, My War. How was it translating a Black Flag song to an acoustic guitar? Yeah, it was kind of, I, I just really liked the song and then I decided to, to learn how to play it just to see what he was kind of mm. doing, what, what the music was. Um, and then when I, when I kind of figured it out, I was like, oh, those are nice notes. And I just sort of played it like, like just letting the notes ring out and stuff. Mm. And um, it just kind of, it, it it was I just sort of played it and I was like, oh, that kind of works. Yeah. I, I didn't really intend to do, I didn't go like, oh, I should do a cover of that song. So sort of like playing it and I was like, kind of, I can kind of do this. Um, and so, yeah, I think with covers, sometimes it's good to like go, oh, I want to cover that and arrange it in whatever way. Yeah. But it's it's cool as well when they when they just sort of come together. Yeah, uh, obviously that was the B-side to Grasp Above My Head, which you're going to play for us tonight. Yeah, yeah. A song like that, obviously there's various little parts to it. Does it evolve over time? Is it, is it quite a, not laboured process, but does it take quite a while to write a song like that? A Grasp Above My Head? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a, it did, I don't know if it took a long time to write, but it was kind of, I'd been listening to a lot of like uh, Todd Rundgren's stuff and um, I'd been getting into all the all the like seventies chordy music, 
uh, which was again was a kind of thing I was snobby of when I was a kid, um, or like a teenager, and uh, just been kind of like like learning some of these chord progressions from like Todd Rundgren songs, uh, like Neil Young songs, and like Big Star is another one that really mm -hmm. I really fell for, and um, and so yeah, it was kind of just like again like learning that sort of stuff and found these kind of chord progressions and I was like I had this the sort of main main thing and I was I had the kind of like main line up sort of in my head as a vocal line um, and uh, singing has always been something that's been kind of uh, something that I was it was a sort of uh, back and forth between kind of like hate and love with it right um, and sort of I've lately been kind of like you know trying to trying to develop singing but it's still a scary thing for me um so so yeah I kind of had it in my head as a vocal line but I felt like it would require like um somebody much less Caucasian than myself to sing <laughs> right. and uh so I was, I was kind of like playing it and I was like I'm never going to be able to sing that convincingly so I start then I was like oh maybe I could play it as a like a guitar line and then it kind of just it took I guess it took a while to kind of come together but um yeah, just sort of played it, and it was it it's like it developed as it went. If you mm. know what I mean. Yeah. So, what's planned now for maybe the rest of the year for you? I mean, is is that song and that single that came out recently enough grasp of my head and my war? Is that kind of a blueprint for what you want to go do next? Are you going to do singing or what? Uh, I don't know if it's a blueprint. It was kind of like I I liked it to think of it as like a little paw, paw like pause in the road after yeah. made the made the record, and that was kind of like a you know big long songs. So I wanted to kind of like pare it down to to some some shorter ones, um, but so at the moment I'm kind of I'm working on a lot of band band stuff. Um, I've been doing this playing with a drummer David Lacey who I've, I've been playing with for years, um, and he's on on the album, and he's a great. It, we kind of just it seems to work really well together. Um, so he's playing drums and my friend Connor's playing bass. And uh, my friend Alva is playing viola, mm -hmm. so we've been kind of working on this like four four piece sort of. It's like it it's it's still some like we do a version of the grass above my head, but it's um still evolving. Yeah, it's still kind of coming together, and it's gotten yeah. kind of a bit sort of psychedelic and a bit okay. uh, a bit rock. And funnily enough, uh, a couple of people have said that we sound a bit like the Grateful Dead, which uh, I know was. Greg Ginn was a. Was a massive sure. fan of apparently. So it all ties together. And they were another one I, I was always was terrified of. Yeah. The Grateful Dead. Well, look, why don't you play "Grass Above My Head" for us? Cool. Thanks yep. very much, Keen. Yep. Here's Keen Nugent on Community of Independence.